This video is sponsored by Displate. Hey, welcome to the Screen Crush Break Room. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. We have so much to break down in this movie, connections to the MCU and comics that are super easy to miss, and we also have a few theories that will tie this movie into Secret Wars, Kang Dynasty, Thunderbolts, and the culmination of the Multiverse Saga. But first, I'm going to go over some of the hidden themes in the movie, because knowing those themes will help us to better understand the rest of the film. The movie's backbone is symbolism associated with gods and the elements, earth, wind, water, and fire. Both the Wakandans and the Talakanians draw their strength from vibranium and the vibranium-fed plants that imbued them with superpowers. The first Black Panther, Bashanga, was led to the heart-shaped herb by the panther goddess Bast, and that herb grows in the ground. And the Wakandan vibranium is inside of a mountain, making Wakanda a nation more closely associated with the element of earth. But the Talakans have a similar parallel origin story. When their people were threatened by colonialism, the god of rain, Chalk, led a shaman into the water to endow all of their people with the ability to become of the water. So Talakan is obviously a nation based around water. I mean, yeah, dude, they live under water. Yes, but they are also a culture that controls the air. Chalk was the god of rain, and rain is water that falls from the sky. In ancient Mayan history, it's said that Kuku Khan worked side by side with Chalk to bring rain to all of the land. Kuku Khan would fly in front of the clouds, signaling the upcoming rain. And remember, the Talakans think that Namor is a god. They called him Kuku Khan. The Feather Serpent God. So we'll talk more about this mythology later on, but this does explain Namor's ability to fly. His people are based around the sky meeting the sea. And this is where this all gets very interesting because Wakanda is also a culture based around fire. Unlike Talakan, they have advanced electricity, a kind of harnessed fire. And Shuri is the most brilliant mind in Wakanda. She is the master of this technological fire. But the first scene in the movie shows her losing control of this mastery. She cannot use this technology to save her brother's life. There's also a crucial scene early in the movie where her mother wants her to burn her ceremonial funeral clothes as a way to let go of her grief. And Shuri says that she is worried that if she does that, then the fire of her grief will burn the world. In other words, she is internalizing her rage the fire within her soul. Fire was also heavily used in conjunction with Eric Killmonger in the first film. He burns the heart-shaped herbs, symbolic of his desire to burn down the world. The world's gonna start over, and this time we're on top. Shuri feels grief and rage similar to her cousins. Eric found his father's body in their apartment. So this was the moment where his rage was born. This is the moment that he could never move past. So this is why he saw his dad's spirit in this same apartment. Shuri sees Killmonger in the throne room for the same reason. She bears his same rage. She's angry at Killmonger, she's angry at herself, and she sees him in the room where her mother was killed. Just like Killmonger, this is the trauma that she cannot overcome. So through Killmonger, her anger lights this room on fire to show how her rage would consume her entire kingdom in eternal war. And here's the thing, we all know that water douses fire. The only way fire can beat water is if it's boiled, and boiling requires tools or technology. Shuri wins by harnessing the technological fire of electricity through a modified ship to heat up Namor, essentially boiling away his water. And fire is how she finally defeats him by setting off an explosion. And an explosion is a fire that burns out of control, just like Shuri's rage is threatening to burn out of control. So as we go through this video, you'll see these themes of the elements and the gods recur over and over again. Again. Hey, the break room looks great today. Thanks, Doug. It's because I hung up all these disc plates. You see, disc plate makes exclusive metal posters, and they're the sponsor of this video. I love disc plate because they take an ordinary poster and turn it into a special collector's item. The posters are durable, but you hang them with magnets, no nails or drilling necessary. And they have posters officially licensed by Marvel, DC, Star Trek, and of course, Star Wars. Now, there are a lot of posters on the site, like more than 1.4 million. Wow, but how will I choose? Well, if you click the link in the description, you'll see my profile, where I've curated some of my favorite posters on the site. I have different collections for Obi-Wan, Spider-Man, Wakanda Forever, and also just some awesome posters that would make great gifts. Each disc plate is signed by a master of production and has a fast expected delivery time of just four to five days. Plus, every time you buy one of these metal posters, disc plate plants a tree. So buying a disc plate is good for the environment and for your break room. We're offering Screen Crush fans a special discount. If you click the link in the description, you get your first one to two disc plates for 32% off. Three or more disc plates are 38% off. Back to the Easter eggs. The movie's themes of gods and spirituality are actually the very first words spoken in the film. Like the first Black Panther film, the movie begins over a dark screen with narration. Baba? Yes, my son. Tell me a story. 
Now in the first movie, it was Eric asking his dad to tell him a story. And in this movie, it is Shuri praying to the goddess Bast to save her brother. But she even tells Bast that if she spares her brother, she will start believing in the goddess. And of course, we know that Bast is real because she was at Zeus's party in Thor Love and Thunder right here. But Shuri is a woman of science, not of superstition. So this scene is setting up her arc for the whole movie, to forgive herself for failing to save T'Challa, but also to accept the spirituality of her people. This also follows her arc in the comics. Shuri was a far more scientific person. Kind of like in the movie, she only became Black Panther after her brother was near mortally wounded. Well, you shall not have been mortally wounded in vain. But in her first spirit quest, she encounters Bast and Bast basically tells her that she should not be looking for power for the sake of power. So, just like in the movie, she thinks her first attempt to gain powers of the heart-shaped herb did not work. Also, after she gets her powers, she knocks a mannequin across the room, just like T'Challa did here. Not that hard, genius! And years later, she goes on another, far better written spirit quest, where she spends several issues communicating with the collective memory of Wakanda. This experience makes Shuri into more of a nature shaman character, fully in tune with the souls of her people. Now that arc is mirrored in this movie, and it all begins in this very first scene with the first sentence. The movie begins with a prayer and establishes that this movie is about gods and connecting with your ancestors through those gods. In the opening scene and all through the movie, her AI is voiced by Trevor Noah, who voiced the Royal Talon fighter in the first film. How long have I got? Glass integrity is at 50%. She's trying to synthesize the heart-shaped herb that Killmonger burned in the first movie. And this was actually set up in the canon book, The Wakandan Files. Now, this is actually a really fun read. It's like a dossier of the Marvel Cinematic Universe gathered by Wakandan intelligence. Now, in the book, Shuri writes about how she's trying to synthesize the herb, where she speculates that using naturally occurring amino acids and then applying vibranium to enhance the effects could work. And this is essentially what she does in this movie. Using the naturally occurring acids within the vibranium plant enhanced it with vibranium to create a new heart-shaped herb. She goes on to study the history of the MCU to find a solution to this problem. Like I said, it's a very cool book. And in the book, she also writes, with some coercion, my brother might allow me to run some blood work. So this, of course, accidentally fits where T'Challa in the movie was keeping his disease hidden, so he kept his sister from examining him. Now, of course, the story in the movie was used as a tribute to the great Chadwick Boseman, who kept his own cancer secret for years. T'Challa's bravery was used to symbolize what Boseman went through in real life, and it gave the movie's heart a real tragedy that resonated past the screen and into the real world. There's a lot to take in. So the opening funeral scene is gut-wrenching for us and the actors because we're all mourning the loss of someone who was gone long before their time. The people at the funeral are wearing white because a Wakandan funeral is a celebration. They're glad he's dead? No, they're not glad, but Wakandans do firmly believe in the afterlife, like T'Challa said. In my culture, death is not the end. They lead you into the green veld where can run forever. They even say at the funeral, thank you for the gift of T'Challa. And this mural is similar to the real life murals of Chadwick Boseman that have been painted around the world. The text here in Wakandan reads, the Panther King forever lives in us. Now in the ceremony, they also mention Bashinga, the first Black Panther and first King of Wakanda, who we kind of saw in the first movie. Now this is a small deviation from the comics. Originally, Bashinga was the first Black Panther and first Wakandan King, but then the more recent Avengers comics show the actual first Black Panther lived in 1 million BC. So Bashanga was technically the second Black Panther, but the first king of Wakanda because he's actually the one who united all the tribes. If we could forge weapons out of this, we'd have a chance against the Atlantean raiders. Maybe. We also see a statue of Bashanga and his first queen, who wears a headdress very similar to the one that Ramonda wears. Now beside his coffin, we see T'Challa's challenge spear and shield from the first movie. It's laying here as a symbol that his fighting is over and he can rest. In the funeral procession, Shuri is carrying T'Challa's original helmet that he wore in Captain America's Civil War. This is another touching tribute to Bozeman because this is the first costume piece that he wore as the character. Shuri has ceremonial dots on her face, similar to the one she wore during combat in the first movie, which actually, you know, I only very recently notice something. In the first movie, she gets Ross set up and she's in a big hurry to go up and fight Killmonger, but somewhere along the way she stops to give herself ceremonial face paint. In African cultures, facial paintings can have a variety of meanings, including for combat, hunting, political standings, or funerals. Joel Harlow, the head of makeup in the first movie, told Teen Vogue in 2018 that Shuri's warrior facial painting is a, quote, modern version of the Cairo and Surrey tribe. And he went on to say, I hypothesize that her warrior paint symbolizes her future status as a future leader in Black 
Black Panther. And we see those dots do foreshadow that role as her panther mask takes on a similar design. T'Challa's coffin bears the face of the Black Panther and a Wakandan salute. And I never really noticed this before, but the underside of a Wakandan ship is also very similar to the mask of the Black Panther. His coffin is raised up in a kind of tractor beam. And this beam does explain how T'Challa was able to jump out of a plane in the first movie and live. The ship's tractor beam would have been slowing his descent. This funeral also parallels that beginning scene. In the first movie, T'Challa falls from the heavens to help people in need. In this movie, he returns to the sky. Then we go to the Marvel Studios logo, which is filled with images of Chadwick Boseman. Now you'll remember that Marvel made a similar tribute of Stan Lee in the opening titles for Captain Marvel. There is no music playing over the opening, just the sound of wind, which is also reflected in the end credits, when Shuri burns her funeral clothes also set to just the sound of wind. The last movie ended with Wakanda opening its borders to the world, and this movie starts by dealing with those consequences. The rest of the world is impatient with Wakanda for not sharing its vibranium and advanced technology, and Ramonda gives a simple explanation for this. You are not ready. Much like the Vulcans, the Wakandans are withholding tech until the people of Earth can get their shit together. Representing the USA is West Wing's Richard Schiff, who's jumping ship from the DC Universe where he played Emil Hamilton. You're my guys, and I'm yours and there's nothing I wouldn't do for you. Now, Richard Schiff is playing the new Secretary of State, taking over from Thunderbolt Ross. So you don't cast Richard Schiff for just a small role, so I'm guessing he's going to keep popping up in other MCU projects like Captain America New World Order. We've also got a couple theories about who the president can be that we're gonna talk about a little later in the video. Now, it's appropriate that the US and France are the most vocal nations against Wakanda. The Americas were conquered by white European colonizers who destroyed Mayan culture, the culture of Namor, and large parts of Africa were colonized by France. Je vous en prie. And France also ruled Haiti for almost 200 years before the Haitians overthrew them and instituted self-rule. And of course, Haiti is where Nakia is living with T'Challa Jr. Now, the scenes at the UN are intercut with the Wakandan Outreach Center. Now, you'll remember that the first film ended with T'Challa establishing a similar outreach center in Oakland. Nakia will oversee the social outreach. You will spearhead the science and information exchange. And this one is in Mali, which was also a French colony. Now, all of this international tension is setting up a third Black Panther film, which we did talk about in our Indian Explained video, and we're gonna talk about a lot more in the next couple weeks. So at the Outreach Center, French operatives try to steal vibranium, which goes down a lot like this. <laughs> They mentioned that vibranium doesn't set off metal detectors, and we saw that in the first film. This is the scene where we meet Michaela Cole's Anika. Now, Anika, where is your spear? Should he get me this to try? In the comics, she has a much more important role. She was a member of the Dora Milaje who executed a chieftain in cold blood for abusing the women of his tribe. Now, for this crime, she was sentenced to death, but she was rescued by Io. Just like in the movie, the two of them are an item. I told you not to bring them. They stole this Midnight Angel armor that we see in the movie, and then they go around Wakanda liberating women from corrupt chieftains. This was during a period of intense political unrest in Wakanda, and they actually led a bit of an uprising against the throne. Wow, none of that is in this movie. No, but it probably will be in the Wakanda spinoff Disney Plus series, which is likely why the character's in this movie at all. Our setups for other things are awesome. Well, just you wait, this movie's got plenty of those. Further attempts on our resources will be considered an act of aggression and met with a much steeper response. Ramonda gives a killer speech, and I really hope this movie finally gets Angela Bassett that Oscar. Have I not given everything? Me too. Writing the exhale was a masterpiece, and she was Stella, who got her groove back. She sure did, buddy. High five. <laughs> And by the way, if you're a fan of epic romantic comedies and you want to support our channel, please check out our merch store at shopzeroedition.com. In addition to our original trilogy t-shirt and our Not The Bee shirt, we now have this hilarious Star Wars scroll text shirt that details the plot of when Harry met Sally. Yes! 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 Check out our link in the description to get yours in time for the holidays. So Ramonda tells the government that she hears their whispers that the king is dead and Wakanda is vulnerable. And she knows this because Wakanda has war dog spies everywhere, like Killmonger said in the first movie. We got spies embedded in every nation on Earth, already in place. And then we go to the Atlantic Ocean, where the USA is looking for vibranium, led by a CIA operative played by Lake Bell. Bell also voiced Black Widow in the What If Disney Plus series, which was also Chadwick Boseman's last Marvel role. Sometimes the best weapon in your arsenal is just a good argument. Now, this whole sequence where the divers are searching for vibranium plays a lot like a horror movie. Except, Namor and the Atlanteans are the monsters. This is all taken from a great Submariner comic called The Depths. It takes place before Namor revealed himself to the world and follows a team of explorers looking to disprove the existence of Atlantis. Instead, Namor murders them one by one. 
Great read. He murders them? I thought Namor was a good guy. Well, he kind of is until he isn't. See, in the comics, Namor is a bit imbalanced. He was an Avenger, but then like the next day, he can decide to wage war in the surface world for dumping one too many Garfield phones into the sea. His origin is also a bit different in the comics. It's actually more like Aquaman's. Actually, Namor predates Aquaman, so it's more like Aquaman's origin is like Namor's. Anyways, Namor's mother was an Atlantean princess and his dad was a ship captain. They fell in love, had Namor, but then her father sent soldiers to the surface to collect the mom and child. Wow, that is like Aquaman. Yes, and that's why they changed it for this movie. See, Atlantis was a work of fiction written by Plato, so the city has always been rooted in these Greco-Roman ideas of what an advanced hidden society would be. But the Black Panther movies are about showing what indigenous societies could have created without colonial conquest. So this change perfectly fits this film. The name of the undersea ship is the Salazar, which could be named after Marvel artist Edgar Salazar, who worked on the comic Rise of the Black Panther. But it's more likely a reference to your mom. Now, the Talacons have a power that the Atlanteans don't they are able to sing songs to mind control people with the jumping off the boat. This is also rooted in mythology with the sirens. See, the sirens were kind of like uh, evil Greek mermaids who would sing to sailors to come to the shores so they could devour them. Island of sirens. But sailor lore often talks about the call of the sea or the song of the sea. My life, my love, my lady. Is the sea. It's what Kermit called the sweet sound that calls the young sailors. That's a good Kermit. High five. High five. So the Wakandans are introduced with a funeral dirge that sends T'Challa away into the heavens. And the Talakans are introduced with another song that calls humans into the sea. Two of the Talakans are important figures in the comics. Namora is Namor's cousin, and Atuma is Namor's chief rival for the Atlantean throne. He is a power-hungry Atlantean, a worshiper of the god Set, who is always trying to conquer Atlantis or the surface world. Now, this movie ends with Namora being upset with Namor's pack, and maybe in Black Panther 3, Atuma will take advantage of that division and try to seize Namor's crown for himself. Then we go back to the surface world where he sees CNN news ticker says that Scott Lang is on a book tour for his autobiography, Look Out for the Little Guy. Now, Ms. Marvel's opening scene mentions that Scott Lang is a superhero celebrity with a popular podcast. And in the Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania trailer, we saw how famous he's gotten. Thank you, Spider-Man. So also like in the first film, the royal family is in a state of flux when the movie begins, with people still mourning their fallen king. And just like in the first movie, we have the royal family arriving in Wakanda at the beginning of the film. Just like in the first movie, Akoya says, we are home. But that scene occurred at dawn, while this one is at sunset, as if to say that the sun is about to set on the Wakandan Empire. But this time, the ship skims over the water, careful to show us exactly how the gate to Wakanda extends over the rivers. The gate is unchanged from how it appeared in Infinity War, even opening a gap for the Queen ship to pass through. Shuri is a lot like Tony Stark, burying herself in her work to overcome her trauma and grief. Ramonda tries to get her in touch with her spiritual side so she can move on, but Shuri has that rage burning within her like we talked about earlier. It's interesting that we see elephants coming into the water when Ramonda and Shuri are having their private funeral burning. Elephants follow a major matrilineal line. They are led by the matriarch with the young calves. These groups don't include males. This is a parallel to Ramonda and Shuri at the time being the only remaining family members of the royal family, and they have this process to grieve together. And then we finally get to meet Namor, played by Tenoch Huerta. My people call me Ahkukunkan. But my enemies call me Namor. Now, Tenoch Huerta is actually Aztec in his heritage, and the Aztecs built their own sprawling civilization that is now in central Mexico. Like I said earlier, I love how this version of Namor is rooted in Mesoamerican culture and history. The Mayan civilization was on the Yucatan Peninsula for more than 2,000 years before the Spanish landed on their shores. We saw part of these historical events depicted in the movie The Eternals. It was the question of colonialism that ultimately caused that family to fracture. And it also divides Namor's people from the surface dwellers. Now, the undersea kingdom in this movie is called Talokan. Now this is based on Tlalokan, which in the Aztec culture was the first of 13 afterlives. This particular afterlife was reserved for people who died from drowning. Now earlier I talked about how the Mayan god Kukulkan served Chak, the god who led the Mayans to their heart-shaped herb. Now he is a Mayan god, but very similar to the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl. There's actually some scholarly debate on whether or not these two are the same deity. Feathered serpent gods were very prominent in Mesoamerican cultures. Oh, and Quetzalcoatl was also in Thor Love and Thunder right here. Now this is where it gets interesting. 
Khan. Kuku Khan is a creator god, the god of wind, rain, storms, and life. And there is still a temple to this deity in Chichen Itza in the Yucatan Peninsula in modern day Mexico and parts of Guatemala and Belize. The artifacts found in this temple are very similar to the mural we see Namor drawing, which is a mural of the god Chak. The cavern where Shuri and Riri are being held in the movie is inspired by a real place, Cenote in the Yucatan, about two hours from Chichen Itza. Now, a Cenote is a type of underwater sinkhole found primarily in Latin America. The Cucu Khan Cenote has a place where fresh water and salt water meet. But the Yucatan Peninsula is also famous for another historical event. The meteor that killed the dinosaurs landed here 66 million years ago. Now, that meteor was larger than Mount Everest, and what do you want to bet? That, in the MCU, that meteor was also filled with vibranium. So this explains why the heart-shaped herbs were growing so close to the Yucatan Peninsula. But also, two vibranium meteors crashing into Earth? That seems like more than a coincidence. Maybe, like in the comics, they could have been sent by the Celestials. Why? Well, in the Earth X comics, vibranium forms a kind of placenta around the celestial baby that's growing in the Earth. Or maybe these vibranium meteors actually were parts of a great ship that were the wreckage from the first multiversal war. Like Miss Minutes said, nearly resulted in the total destruction of well, everything. So what if the first multiversal war was so devastating that it sent shrapnel from the ships through all of time and space? And the conflict was so enormous that the ships were as large as planets and completely made of vibranium. So now those shards of the ships were sent throughout the entire multiverse. If this is the case, then maybe vibranium is the key to the plans of Kang the Conqueror. Like we theorized in past videos, Kang is trying to build a device in the quantum realm to help his army escape. And if that army runs on vibranium, then that would be a great way to tie Namor and the Wakandans into Avengers the Kang Dynasty. So the key to defeating Kang could actually just be vibranium, forcing Wakanda, Talokan, and the Avengers to all work together. Anyways, Kuku Khan and other Mayan gods actually do exist in Marvel Comics as part of a group called the Ajaw. So Namor goes to the shore and immediately compliments the Wakandan environment. This place is amazing. The air is pristine. In the comics, Namor would always get angry at the surface world for environmental reasons. Also very much like Aquaman's brother in Aquaman. Yes, that's right. Like I said, I'm very glad they changed his motivations in this movie. His main goal is to stay hidden from the world of the colonizers, so he sends the Wakandans to hunt down an American scientist who turns out to be Riri William. You need to be conscious of the way that you look. Walking around here with that ash on your head. <laughs> Now, to contact her, he gives them a conch or a large shell and tells them to blow in it when they find her. In William Golding's Lord of the Flies, a conch is used as a symbol of power and leadership. Whoever holds the conch gets to speak. Because it can make a loud sound that commands the attention of others. Then we go to the meeting of the Wakandan Council, featuring the legendary Dorothy Steele in her final role before her death. So, the members of the Wakandan tribes are all designed based on their region and inspired by real African cultures. The Border Tribe are inspired by the Lesotho, and they wear blue and wear items that are rhino themed. The River Tribe, like Nakia, wear green and also wear shells and crocodile scales. The Merchant Tribe is inspired by the Tuao of Saram, and they wear purple. The Mining Tribe are inspired by the Himba and Maasai. They wear red and orange, and lion-themed objects. And finally, we have a new addition to the council, the Jabari, led by M'Baku. They wear white fur and wood to honor their god, the gorilla Hanuman. Now, you'll remember that T'Challa helped the Jabari break their isolationist stance in the last movie. I will give no Jabari lives towards your cause. It is our cause. When M'Baku enters, he's eating a carrot, a subtle callback to his joke from the last film. One more word, and I will feed you to my children. I'm kidding, we are vegetarians. Winston Dukes M'Baku is a very interesting character. Now, he's a very proud man, very set in his principles. But, as we saw in the last movie, he is amendable to change. No, I could use an army as well. No. Twelve seconds later. Witness the might of the Jabari! In the first film, he didn't think much of Shuri. As your technological advancements have been overseen by a child who scoffs at tradition. But in this movie, she throws his words back at him and he accepts her as the new Black Panther. So the realization that there were two vibranium meteors and two gods leading two different shamans to these plants kind of reinforces Shuri's belief that this mysticism isn't real. After all, how can the Wakandans be a chosen people if there was another hidden civilization around the globe that also thinks they were chosen? Okoye echoes this when she says that the existence of a second vibranium rich land upends everything she ever knew as a child. And then we cut to Everett Ross, who was a special attack shade to T'Challa in the comic, but in the movies, he's a CIA operative who owes them a debt after Shuri saved his life in the first movie. Bullet wounds don't just magically heal overnight. They do here. And he's on a run listening to Can't Stop by RHCP. My man. <laughs> 
Now, last time we saw Ross chronologically was actually a deleted scene in the first film where he ran into T'Challa at the UN and tried to get in the king's good graces. What you guys have is gonna scare a lot of people in that room. They're gonna come after you. This hinted at a further partnership with the Wakandans in this movie. But the big reveal in this movie is that his ex-wife is none other than the Contessa Allegra de Fontaine. Get now this was a huge surprise. Now we know that Val isn't just working for some shady government agency. She's the leader of the shady government agency, the CIA. <laughs> now we've seen Val hands-on recruiting different heroes in several different projects. First, John Walker. Things are about to get weird. We're gonna need a US agent. And then Yelena Belova and D23 revealed that she would be leading or heavily involved with the MCU's Thunderbolts, a team of anti-hero super soldiers plus ghosts. In our Ending Explained video, we speculated that the Thunderbolts would be used to undermine and infiltrate Wakanda with Val overseeing the team like Amanda Waller oversees the Suicide Squad. Now I got a few more theories on her and Thunderbolt Ross that I'm gonna go over in just a bit, but first let's talk about Riri Williams. Now Riri was pretty great in this movie, even if you don't really need her character in the film, but I am very much looking forward to her Ironheart spinoff show. So in the comics, Riri is a super duper smart kid who grew up very poor in Chicago. When she was a kid, her best friend and her stepdad were killed in a drive-by shooting, which she actually alludes to in this movie. The muscle car that she owns belonged to her stepdad. Now in the comics, she also builds her own Iron Man suit while she's a student at MIT, just like in this film. Now we don't see her building her suit in the movie, but there are a series of Target ads that show her creating the Mark I suit. Just like with Tony, this involved a lot of trial and error, accidents and beating metal with a hammer. Much like Riri built her armor as a student, Tony Stark built his first AI also when he attended MIT according to these articles that we see in Iron Man 1's first montage. And like Tony, her first flight begins all happy and joyous, but then ends with her expending the suit's capabilities and falling to the earth. One of the FBI guys even says she has Iron Man tech, but in the comic, she actually filled in for Iron Man while Tony Stark was in a coma. And Tony created an AI hologram of himself to be her voice in the suit. Now I doubt this is gonna happen in the Ironheart show, because Robert Downey Jr. wouldn't return just to play second fiddle to a new character in a streaming series. Also, his presence would overshadow Riri. When Shuri and Okoye come to her dorm room, there is a Chicago Bulls pillow and the flag of Chicago and a poster here filled with hexagons. Not the beast! Then in her garage lab, there is a small figure of Maz Kanata from The Force Awakens. Then the feds come and we get another neat reversal of the first movie. That film had a chase scene where Shuri was remote piloting a car and the Wakandans were chasing down Claw. But in this movie, it's the Wakandans who are running away from the law. And also in the comics, right after Shuri becomes queen, she goes to Washington DC to meet the president and then is immediately attacked by French zombies. Then the Talacons interrupt the chase with their water bombs, which is actually a very clever weapon. Water can actually be an incredibly destructive force when used with enough kinetic energy. Like I said earlier, the Wakandans used fire, explosives, but Namor's people are water-based. It was awesome how the movie found a way to use their element as a weapon. Atuma and Okoye have a fight, and he actually fights above water really well. Like, he should have been at a disadvantage, but all the Talakans kick the crap out of the Wakandans later in the movie. All right, so Shuri goes under the sea, and Okoye has to report back to the queen that she has failed, and Ramonda strips away her title. Like I said, this is a reflection of Io and Anika's Midnight Angel run in the comics, except this kind of just feels like the beginning beginning of a story where Okoye is the subject of that Wakanda Disney Plus series, which I'm betting is going to be called The Midnight Angels. Before she's dismissed, one of the council members reminds Ramonda that Okoye raised a spear to her husband for Wakanda. Who's her husband? That would be Wakabi, Daniel Kaluuya's character from Black Panther 1. Would you kill me, my love? For Wakanda? Without question. It's not super clear that they're married in the movie. That was mostly just in a deleted scene. This is what you would have me leave the daughter for, to bring our children into this world where they become conquerors. They also say that Wakabi is still alive, probably in a Wakandan jail. I mean, actually, Daniel Kaluuya chose to be in Jordan Peele's Nope instead of being in this movie. But you gotta admit, he would be a great addition for the third film. If the government wants to stir up political unrest in Wakanda, then they would get Wakabi released and inserted back into the populace. Kind of like how the Germans released Lenin back into the Tsar's Russia. Yes, like that. Ramonda also mentioned that Okoye initially sided with Killmonger in the war, but like that was not Okoye's fault. She was sworn to obey the throne, so kind of a low blow there. Ramonda then goes on to recruit Nakia, saying that she's been gone for six years. 
So the timeline was the first movie took place in 2016. She and T'Challa got together at the end of that film. Then she would have gotten pregnant right before the snap, left after the snap, and now it's been one year since T'Challa died, which would have happened shortly after Endgame, which explains why Nakia was not there in the final battle against Thanos. T'Challa, Nakia's son's Haitian name is Toussaint. Now this could be a reference to Toussaint Louventure, who was a renowned Haitian general, who was the most prominent leader of Haiti and a key figure in the Haitian Revolution, gaining their independence from France. Interesting since Nakia and T'Challa's new home is in Haiti, and the French were the ones at the beginning who attacked the Wakandan ship. So in Talakan, they want Shuri to wear traditional clothing, and Riri says that's supervillain behavior. She cites the following three examples, Beauty and the Beast, Indiana Jones, and Princess Leia. Those are three properties that are all owned by Disney. I'm surprised they didn't just hit for the cycle there. He's gonna trick her into marrying him like Miss Piggy did to Kermit in Muppets Take Manhattan, and you're, they're gonna underestimate you like they underestimated that rabbit in Zootopia. Now, like I keep saying, I loved how Namor's origin was adjusted for the movie, especially how it's kind of the other side of the coin from Wakanda's origin. Wakanda shows us an Afro-futurist world, a projection of what an African culture could have become without colonial interference. But Talakan is a reaction to colonialism, so their people are obviously much less inclined to make nice with the surface world. Their vibranium herb was used to protect them against the Spanish, not to unite their tribes. And when Namor explains his origin, he actually says the words, I'm a mutant, which is mm, so great to hear in the MCU. So for years, Marvel Studios was forbidden to use any form of the word mutant in their movies because the X-Men film rights were with Fox. But now that Disney owns Fox, we're slowly seeing mutants creep into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Kamala has a mutation. She-Hulk teased a guy with metal claws getting into a bar fight, maybe Wolverine. And of course, Professor Charles Xavier's variants appeared in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. <laughs> Now, Namor is technically classified as a mutant in the comics, but I don't think the vibranium herb necessarily causes people to become mutants in the MCU. But if you have a dormant X gene, then the vibranium can kickstart it, like how the bangle kickstarted Kamala's mutation. Also, Namor was born different because his mom took the herb when she was pregnant, so this allowed him to live in two worlds, a lot like Blade, whose mom was bitten by a vampire when she was pregnant with him, making him a daywalker. And I also love the new source of his war name. But my enemies call me Namor. A priest called him El Nino Sin Amor, the boy with no love, which when you shorten it just sounds Namor. Then he brings Shuri to Talakan using jet streams, kind of like we saw in Finding Nemo. Hey, grab shell, dude! Grab what? One small detail I loved is how through most of the movie, the location titles are translated from Wakandan glyphs. But in Talakan, the name of the city is translated from a more Mesoamerican alphabet, composed of figures representing letters. All around, we see how they preserved Mesoamerican culture, including the ball game that is an ancient precursor to basketball. I really love the look of Talakan, the way they designed a city that is truly imagined without gravity, unlike Aquaman, where the Atlanteans still kind of build on a flat plane. Now, Namor tries to convince Shuri that the surface dwellers will never leave their nations alone and that they need to form an alliance and attack first. And then we cut to the surface dwellers planning to wage a preemptive war against them. Val says that the president wants to destabilize Wakanda. And guys, here's a thought. What if the president is a person that we've met in the MCU before? What if the new president is Thunderbolt Ross? Get off my plane. I mean, after William Hurt died, they could have just retired the character and said that the Thunderbolts were named in his honor. But instead, Marvel cast Harrison Ford in this role. They have big things planned for this character. Maybe so they could let him play the president one last time. So this could be a major conflict that goes through the movie The Thunderbolts and through Captain America New World Order. General Thunderbolt Ross, now President Ross, trying to control superpowered people around the globe starting with undermining Wakanda to seize their vibranium. Now, throughout history, colonial powers were able to conquer native tribes by pitting them against one another. And that is what's happening here, with Wakanda and Talakan going to war with each other. After Nakia kills one of these Mer people, Namor declares war against them. Now, his throne is made from the jaws of a megalodon, and to me, it kind of looks like it has vibranium teeth. Namor's crown is a Mayan headdress because, after all, he is worshipped as a feathered god. Namor's mercurial turn from compassionate to angry is also one of his traits in the comics, where his blood imbalance causes him to Cause a little mad sometimes. Back in Wakanda, Okoye is in the middle of name dropping Thanos to Nakia when the country begins to flood. Now in the comics, Namor launched a devastating attack on Wakanda, flooding the country and killing hundreds. 
M'Baku immediately saves one of his tribemen in a boat. Remember that even though the Jabari live in the mountains, they do have fishermen. One of our fishermen found him at the edge of the river border. Now, it is kind of weird that the Talakans can attack a landlocked country from the water, but let's just say they swam up the rivers unnoticed. A few cool details to notice in this fight. The Talakan shields are made from turtle shells, and the shot of Namor rising out of the sea is composed like the shot of him as a child fighting the slavers. Also, I've always thought that Namor's wings were a little silly in the comics, but in the movie, they're kind of badass. Because they're so small, he can change direction quickly like a hummingbird. When Namor attacks the throne room, he shouts Imperious Rex, his battle cry from the comics and the slogan written on this display. Now, Ramonda dying is extremely sad, but it does leave Shuri with no choice but to step up and be a leader. After her funeral, M'Baku advises Shuri to be in tune with her spiritual side, telling her to not bury herself in technology. Then, she throws his words from the challenge scene in the first movie back at him, saying, you are not afraid to hear from a child that scoffs at tradition. Meanwhile, back in America, Ross is watching CNN, where a news ticker talks about a trade agreement with New Asgard just before he is arrested. Now, this subplot with Ross kind of went nowhere, except into the next movie movie or the Wakanda spinoff show. There's a nice bit of irony that Shuri is able to synthesize the heart-shaped herb using the fibers that Namor gave her, so he is kind of the instrument of his own downfall. And when she prepares the herb, she uses the traditional tools that we saw in the last movie and none of her scientific gear. And the tools are all white, symbolizing the ceremonial funeral garb that she is still unable to burn. This is showing that she is not taking the herb to protect Wakanda, she is trying to avenge Wakanda because she is unable to let go from the fiery rage that she feels from her family's debts. Riri asked Shuri how she learned how to do science, and she says that her brother taught her. And this is a lovely little addition to the canon. In the comics, T'Challa is a super scientist. I think he's the third smartest person on Earth. And he was the one who built Wakanda's futuristic technology. This line shows us that this version of T'Challa was also a genius. He just had other responsibilities to attend to. Now we learned that an important part of the ceremony is who you actually see in the ancestral plane. You choose the person that guides you as the Black Panther. Killmonger was guided by his grief, so he saw his father. T'Challa was guided by tradition, so he saw his father. And Shuri is guided by rage, so she sees Killmonger. She's also still wearing her traditional funeral garb because she cannot let go of her brother. In fact, when she gets angry at Eric and says, you killed my brother, the room begins to burn. This is symbolic of the burning of the heart-shaped herb and also symbolic of Shuri's anger, but it's also a warning. A warning that her rage could spark an eternal war with Talakan that would burn away her kingdom. Killmonger calls T'Challa weak and says that he let his father's killer live, referencing this scene from Captain America's Civil War. The living are not done with you yet. Afterwards, she thinks the ceremony did not work, just like after she first takes the herb in the comics. And the new suit has her traditional face markings, but also some of Killmonger's gold in the edges, symbolizing that his rage is part of her identity as this new panther. Later, we see that the suit also features her sonic gauntlets like we saw her use in the first film. And to prove her worth to M'Baku, she arm wrestles him and takes him over the top. But M'Baku is worried that her strength might not be enough and compares Namor's strength to the Hulk. It's actually kind of nice to know that in a world now filled with superpowered people, the Hulk is still like the basic accepted standard for strength. I loved how this final act is really an internal battle for Shuri. She has to overcome her own demons for her nation to win. Riri also puts together her new armor, which is actually very comic accurate. Both she and the Midnight Angels have first person heads up displays like Tony Stark's in Iron Man. So they work out that Namor breathes through his skin like an amphibian and that the key to victory was just to dry him out, which is actually Aquaman's weakness in the comics that he can't be away from the ocean for more than an hour. So they actually chose the lamest part of Aquaman's story and applied it to Namor. Do you have any water? I gotta hydrate. So when Shuri has Namor at her mercy, she hears Killmonger's voice calling her from the spirit realm, urging her to finish Namor off. But then she sees her mother and she repeats the words that she told T'Challa in his waterfall duel. Mm. And then she sees these really lovely flashes of Talakans intercut with the Wakandans to show that really we are all one people. So she spares Namor and says that they have to move beyond vengeance for the sake of their people. And as a symbol of their unity, she plants a flower from Talakan in Wakanda. This also shows that she is now valuing the old ways and upholding the spiritual traditions of the Black Panther. And when she returns to the lab, Riri greets her like she greeted her brother in the first movie. It's a nice way to show that she has come full circle. She tells Riri that she can't leave with the armor, which means she'll have to restart her origin story for the Ironheart show. Boy, she really didn't need to be in this movie, did she? Not at all, but I liked her. 
Me too. Shuri says she has something to do, and then we cut to the waterfall coronation. But instead, we get this twist where she doesn't go, and M'Baku challenges for the throne like he did in the first movie. See, I think this happens not because M'Baku's trying to steal the throne. I think Shuri does not want to be queen. She wants to focus on being the Black Panther and trust M'Baku to be a good steward for her country. After all, T'Challa was first the Black Panther while his father was still king. So it's not a requirement for someone to fulfill both roles at once. All right, so we talked about the ending in our Ending Explained video, so make sure you watch that one if you haven't already. And now it's break time. You know, Doug, you did a really great job hanging these disc plates. I didn't hang them. I thought you did. Wait, if you didn't hang them, and I didn't hang them, then who did? Oh well, just a reminder to click my link in the description to shop for your displays today. And we want to hear from all of you. What did you think of Wakanda Forever? Tell me in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.